Excited to have Eric Crystal here to talk to us about not necessarily Gobi, but who Gobi are feeding in the Niagara River. So think yeah. away. Thank you, Brad. Um, just when you thought you were done with all the link surgery talks, <laughs> there's one more. Although this this is pretty relevant to this session. Um, I'm going to be presenting work that I conducted as a grad student at SUNY Buffalo State in collaboration with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the University of Windsor. So the impacts of invasive species on native species is pretty complex. Um, they can modify the habitat physically and also they can alter the structure of the food web and also the way energy flows. Um, I like this figure because it illustrates pretty simply that second effect where in the reference condition uh, lake trout fed on a mix of nearshore prey fish and also offshore zooplankton. However, in the invaded condition, uh, with the establishment of rock bass uh, depleting the nearshore fish population, lake trout shifted to a diet of predominantly pelagic zooplankton, um, and as a result, their trophic level decreased. Um, and this, these kinds of interactions are happening all over the Great Lakes. Um, and the Great Lakes really exemplify this because of the amount of invasive species that are here and, be, and being introduced all the time um, as a result of their importance in global trade. And two of the most notable invaders would be triceted mussels and also round gobies. Um, so this is a figure from Brian Waddell and, and Gorman um, looking at the abundance of round gobies throughout the Great Lakes. Um, they were established for, they were first found in the Great Lakes in, the, in 1990 in the St. Clair River and have since spread to four of the five lakes. Um, you can see their abundance is kind of variable, but uh, it's pretty clear that they're an established part of the ecosystem. Looking at Lake Ontario here specifically, um, they pretty much show up in bottom trawls around 2002, 2003, and then peak in abundance uh, 2008. Since then, it's declined a little bit, but we see another spike in, in 2015. Um, so again, they're a persistent part of the Lake Ontario food web, and also uh, the Niagara River, which is the main tributary to Lake Ontario. So this is the Niagara River. Um, it's a connecting channel between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, and it flows northwards. It is split in half by uh, Niagara Falls, into the upper portion and the lower river. Um, the upstream part of the lower river is known as the Niagara Gorge. It has very steep cliffs, um, fast water, it's very deep, um, and it's pretty rough to work in. So this, stu this study was conducted mostly um, in the section of the river that's nice and calm and <laughs> wide, and that's, that's right near the mouth of Lake Ontario, right here. And one of the projects that the Fish and Wildlife Service has been working on for a while, uh, for the past few years anyway, is uh, an assessment of the recovering sturgeon population that's present there. And uh, we're really interested in the population size, its health, and also what this population is feeding on. Especially because, oh, well, so lake sturgeon um, are generalist opportunistic <coughs> benthic feeders. Uh, Harkness and Diamond in 1961 said that anything living on the bottom is eaten by lake sturgeon. And that's really true. Um, a study conducted in the St. Lawrence, uh, looking at the diets of, of juvenile lake sturgeon, found over 74 different taxa in their stomach, some of which are pictured here. Um, and it's also been noted that lake sturgeon diets are very system specific. And so you'll have a population that feeds heavily on chironomids, for instance, or crayfish, or even uh, for synod mussels. So you really need to study what the population is eating um, in your system. And so we were curious to see what they were eating in the lower Niagara given the invaded nature of that system. <coughs> so this, this recovery of sturgeon in the lower Niagara is occurring in a system that is completely different from the historical ecosystem. Uh, this figure is from a colleague at Buffalo State, Dr. Miller who conducted a survey of the benthic invertebrate families found in the lower river. Um, this was done by Ponar Grabs. And these are the top five families that he found, and two of them, which I indicated with the arrows, are invasive species, including the number one most commonly found 
which is Echinogamrus ischmus, which is an invasive amphipod found in over 50% of the sites. Um, the other invasive being quagga mussels. So we're wondering how this sturgeon population is utilizing these invasive species. Um, the, the, another invasive species, the third one that I'm going to be talking mostly about, is round goby. This is a still from a videographic assessment that Dr. Canudo and Dr. Miller did. Um, it's a little bit hard to see, but so I'll circle them when they're, when they're not moving, they're hard to see. And I think Dr. Canudo will, will be presenting a video of this, so let's see it. But, so there's at least four in here. There's more, but I didn't circle them. And they estimated <coughs> um, about 17 go on average about 17 gobies per meter squared in the lower river and 22, it's cut off on the bottom, but I have 22 gobies per meter squared in near shore Lake Ontario. So pretty high numbers, not 100 meter per meter squared like we heard earlier, but it's still pretty high. So the purpose of the study real quick was to describe the short and long term diet history and trophic position of Lake Sturgeon in the lower river. And to do that, we employed two methodologies. We did stomach content analysis and stable isotope analysis. Uh, stomach content analysis gives you the most recent feeding, so what they ate in the past hour or a few hours, and also gives you fairly high taxonomic precision. And it can be used to evaluate your stable isotope model. Stable isotope analysis gives you an idea of their longer term diet history. Um, and it only takes into account material that's actually assimilated into tissue, not just ingested. We use two elements <coughs> using carbon, um, which their carbon signature tells you about their carbon sources, and also nitrogen, which gives you an idea of the consumer's trophic position. So this is a photo of me um, using gastric lavage to get some of the stomach contents from the sturgeon. Um, we ended up getting stomach contents from 56 fish, and this is a, an, a, an example of some of the things that we found. We found a diversity of prey items, um, but a lot of the most important items were uh, crayfish, um, occasionally quagga mussels, uh, a lot of these invasive amphipoda kind of gamorous, and a lot of gobies, including this, this monster goby, 14 centimeters, and it must have been a real pain to, to cough up. <laughs> This is a summary of the stomach content data that we found. Um, on the y-axis is the percentage. On the bottom, we have the different prey groups. And I've ranked them in terms of their frequency of occurrence, which is the black bars. But I've also included um, their percent weight and also their count. So looking at amphipods, they occur the most frequently, about 85% of the stomachs. Um, and also their count accounts for a lot, just because there's a ton of them. But if you look at their weight, the gray bar, um, it's actually not that important. Um, looking at round goby next, they appear in over 60% of the stomachs. And their count, while their count isn't that significant, they um, contribute to the vast majority of the weight of the diets. Some other important uh, items in, in terms of weight are crayfish and also mussels. And there's some other invertebrates too, but they don't figure that too importantly. So this is a figure that, uh, too bad the bottom is cut off, but um, that illustrates the, the, that plots the dietary importance based on their weight of different prey groups um, versus their frequency of occurrence. So this is percent frequency of occurrence here. And depending on where different prey items appear on this plot, it tells you a little bit about the feeding character of Lake Sturgeon. So along this axis, um, in this area, you would have things that appear uh, very infrequently and also in small amounts, so there would be rare prey. And then over here would be things that occur uh, very frequently and in large amounts, the dominant prey. Along in this axis, we have variation between individuals and variation within individuals. Um, so something that, that, so prey items that, that plot here um, would be selected by a few individuals, but in large amounts. And then here would be things that are selected for by many individuals, but not in very large amounts. And finally, along this axis, it tells you about the feeding strategy. So if a lot of prey items are appearing down here, it's indicative of a more generalist feeding strategy. 
um, and if parenchymas appear here, it's a specialist feeding strategy. So if I add in the data, um, looking at, first we'll look at mussels. Um, like I said, they don't occur very frequently, so not many fish ate them, but when they did, they, had, they actually ate quite a few, so that's why they appear up here. Amphipods appeared in almost all stomachs, um, but not, in not very large amounts. And then there's this, uh, an array of different invertebrates and in some fish that occur infrequently in not large amounts. And finally, if we look over here, we see that gobies appear very frequently and in large amounts, and they would be termed our dominant prey. And so, we can kind of see that generalist feeding behavior that sturgeon are known for um, in this diversity of prey items down here, but we're also seeing that they're very selective for goby, and to a lesser extent, some individuals are for mussels. So we'll see if that story holds up when we look at stable isotope analysis. Um, so we collected food web samples using ponar grabs. We also collected uh, three different lake sturgeon tissues. We collected fin tissue and also blood tissue, which was then spun and separated into plasma and red blood cells. Uh, the reason we did that is because different tissues have different turnover rates, and meaning they represent the diet over different time scales. <coughs> So blood tends to turn over faster, so it would give you an indication. It would be isotopically more similar to the diet over the past uh, few weeks or month. Uh, fin tissue turns over more slowly and is representative of the diet of a year or more. So this is a stable isotope biplot um, with nitrogen on the y-axis and carbon along the x-axis. And unfortunately, you can't see the numbers, but they're there. Um, typically, when you look at a plot like this, um, an increase in nitrogen is indicative of, a, of increased trophic level, and there's also an enrichment factor that happens between trophic levels. So, we used uh, values of 0.4, so when you're moving up a trophic level, carbon increases by 0.4, nitrogen by 0.3. So you would expect the position of the consumer to be here relative to its prey. So if I turn these arrows into a slope, and then bring in the data, we can see the structure of this part of the Niagara River, river food web. Uh, down at the bottom, you have mussels, chronomids, amphipods, oligochaetes. Um, kind of in the middle, you have more omnivorous species like crayfish, snail. Then you see round goby here. And finally, at the top, we see the different uh, lake sturgeon tissues that we're seeing. And it's, it's, it's nice that lake sturgeon tissue falls in line along the slope with these different prey items, which means that we're probably not missing some important prey item that we didn't analyze. So this, this tends to work out pretty nicely. Um, and this is a good visual illustration of the diet, but if you wanted to find out exactly what percent contributions these different prey items had to lake surgeon tissue, you have to run a, a stable isotope mixing model, and that's what we did. So these are the results of the model from, uh, for red blood cells and also plasma on the bottom uh, with proportion or contribution to the diet on uh, the y-axis and then prey groups on the x. So looking at red blood cell first, we see that amphipods uh, have the largest contribution to the diet, about 50%. Round goby are second, about 20%. And crayfish a little bit too, about 10% or so. Looking at plasma, um, Snails figure more prominently, round gobies are still prominent, around 50%, um, and mussels and crayfish are also important. So we're seeing a, a diversity of items here. However, when we look at the fin tissue, it's, it's round goby all the time. It's all round goby. It's 100, near 100% contribution to the diet. Um, and then what this tells us is that there's some variation and um, diversity in the diets in the short term as reflected in the blood, but when you look at uh, fin tissue and its longer turnover rate, that means they're eating, they're mostly eating gobies, and not just in the months that we sampled, but all year round. So in conclusion, uh, <coughs> round gobies are, are definitely an important part of the LNR food web, um, and sturgeon are very reliant upon them. Um, what's, what's very interesting about this study is that where not only are they eating invasive species, but they're eating a lot of fish. And this really isn't, hasn't been seen in many other systems, 
I know Ron Brook talked about uh, the consumption of, of dead gizzard shad in Lake Winnebago, but that's really like a short-term or seasonal treat for them, and I don't think they're eating them all year round. Um, and also in the Rainy River, there is some stable isotopic evidence of them eating fish eggs, but again, like the directed uh, predation on live fish prey is something that's, that hasn't really been seen before. And the sturgeon in the lower river have a higher trophic level as a result. Um, a related study that we, that we conducted that was just accepted for publication found that lake sturgeon in the lower Niagara River uh, post Gobi invasion reach a higher trophic level at a younger age compared to sturgeon um, pre Gobi. And also we're seeing very high growth rates in the, in the lower river also. So, I mean, I'm being facetious here, but um, they're definitely an important part of the food web, and it could be supporting the recovery, but there's a huge caveat. Uh, round gobies prey on lake sturgeon eggs, and if you saw Dimitri's talk yesterday, we're seeing a, a pretty disconcerting drop in recruitment from 2002 on, and so that's something you know, it's not, we haven't determined the cause of that, but it's something that we're going to have to look into for the future. With that, I'd like to acknowledge my funding sources and also the many people that helped me on this project. And I'll take any questions. Thank you. <laughs>